Chip Gibson. Swing. This is going to be a home run. Unbelievable. I don't believe what I just saw. Pete Rose hit the big leagues in 1963 with bad grades, no power, no speed, no throwing arm. But he played with an uncommon fury, sprinting to first base on every walk. 24 years and 4,256 hits later, Charlie Hustle had long won everyone's respect. He was the all-American icon of hard, fair play. Then the whistle blew. Instead of Charlie Hustle, we had Charlie the Hustler as Rose was banned from the love of his life. Banishment for life of Pete Rose from baseball, the sad end of a sorry episode. One of the game's greatest players has engaged in a variety of acts which have stained the game. If Pete Rose is the classic example of the one-dimensional sports machine, he had the misfortune to collide at home plate, as it were, with Bart Giamatti, who was the most rounded, nuanced, complex intellectual, former president of Yale, student of literature, philosopher. Baseball, he said, was naturally an epic sport like no other. And he demonstrated it by comparing it to Homer's Odyssey. The batter starts at home plate. And then he takes off for a journey around the bases, which is filled with danger. At every stop, somebody is trying to put him out. But he has, by guile and strength and speed, comes home where he is greeted with delight by his waiting comrades. So Bart very much thought that the essence of an epic is there is a hero. Bart liked Pete because Pete was Charlie Hustle. He was a little guy, Bart was a little guy, and I think there was a certain affinity, a certain admiration that Bart felt for uh, Rose, which made it painful. Every day, he went to a big league ballpark and walked into a clubhouse. He walked by the rules. One of the rules is that you shall not have the perception to your paying customers that something might be tainting the integrity of the competition, such as a wager. Everything rests on that. I can remember Pete going by the sign, looking at the sign, and we, yeah, geek, 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 and walking, kind of laughing. Pete felt bigger than any one person in the game. I mean, he thought Bart Giamatti was going to say, okay, Pete, just watch out out there. It's, you know, watch, watch who you hang with. And I think he was shocked, just shocked, that he did not receive the same treatment that he had been receiving for the last 20 years. I am confronted by the factual record of Mr. Dowd, and on the basis of that, yes, I have concluded that he bet on baseball. Well, regardless of what the commissioner said today, uh, I did not bet on baseball. Uh, that's all I can say. I know it's eating him up inside. Baseball, that's all that he ever wanted to do. That's all he ever talked about. I'm sure that's all he ever dreamed about when he was sleeping. Baseball, 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 baseball. I don't think it ever occurred to Pete that he wouldn't be in that Hall of Fame. Early on in his career, that was a given to him, that his bust was going to be there with Ty Cobb, with Tris Speaker, with all the greats. Even at the very end, when he was called in to the commissioner of baseball's office, and he was made to cool his heels in the outer office, he said, hey, you got all these pictures up here, and there were pictures of all these great ball players. Why ain't my picture up there? I think he was probably also giving some kind of message, like, you know, you better be careful who you're messing with, because you're messing with history. I believe I'm the best ambassador baseball has, because I have to believe that my name is kind of synonymous with the game of baseball. Don't tell me that baseball wouldn't be better if I'm in it. You know, to me, you're two different people, and I think the public ought to know it. When you're playing baseball, you're one person. I call you a man that will do anything to win and actually... You call me an animal. Well, I call you the animal, that's right. 
He's the only man I ever been around that never thought he was over 18 years old. He always believed that he was young and vibrant. Pete wound up a perpetual adolescent. Pete is on an airplane, team airplane, and it hits severe turbulence. And he turns to his teammate in the seat next to him and says, we're going down. We're going down, and I have a 300 career average. Do you? You know, when kids get involved in sports, you know, the uniform is really important to them. Pete, being a kid, loved his uniform. He loved the way he looked in it. He had to wear his socks a certain way. You know, he had to have his shirt tucked in a certain way. His shoes had to be shined. Part of baseball for Pete was looking like a ball player. When I was a rookie riding on the airplanes, I used to always sit by Wade Hoyt, who did the play-by-play -play for the Reds for many, many, many years, and also pitched for the Yankees. He would just tell me story after story about Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb. They all seemed to have the same attitude back in those days. They all were tough. And a fight breaks out. A fight breaks out. Pete Rose and Buddy Harrelson. Both clubs spill out of the dugouts. Rose's kamikaze role in the Mets' Bud Harrelson ignited the fight in the 1973 playoffs. But it was in the 1970 All-Star Game where Rose's uncompromising ferocity was laid bare for all to see. In the bottom of the 12th, he was steaming home with the potential winning run. Rose is on the way around, picked up by Otis. Rose is coming to the plate, throws a throw. He's in. It's all over. The National League win. Rose turned himself into a missile, crashed into Fossey, and effectively ended his career. He throws barreled into Ray Fossey, who is slow in getting up. We were out with the Fosseys. We have dinner, and we come back home. He said, well, good night, I'll see you. That next day is when he ran right into Frosty. I mean, that was, it was unbelievable. I said, how could you do that to our friends and hurt him? He said, that's the name of the game. Pointless. A, a huge, disproportionate act. A sense of complete loss of perspective. How about these people say, well, you shouldn't slide hard like that. It's an all-star game. Those people are losers. What do you mean you shouldn't slide like that? People paid more money for those all-star tickets than they do for a regular season game. Why shouldn't I play hard? Huh? I'm not supposed to try to win that game because it's an all-star game? He's the fan as player. He's the guy sitting at the bar who says, God, if I could only do it, I'd go out there and I'd do it every day. He won over the fans with that ferocious force. He's not the best baseball player I ever saw. But he played every game like the seventh game in the World Series. He played hard every single day. And I've never seen anyone else do that. If he got three hits, he wanted four. If he got four hits, he wanted five. He was insatiable. He wanted to be the first singles hitter to drive a Cadillac. And damn sure did it. I met Richie Ashburn. He says, you can't believe this guy. He says, I've never seen anything like him. He is the most obsessive person I've ever seen. He said it doesn't make any difference whether it's playing baseball, sex, gambling, whatever. He does everything absolutely full out. He said if Pete drank, he'd have been an alcoholic when he was 16 years old. Pete Rose was a local boy in the city that prides itself, rightly, as the birthplace of professional baseball. Cincinnati was a very elemental city. It was called Porkopolis in the 19th century. It was where pigs were slaughtered and grains and goods went up the Ohio River and back down. And Charles Dickens and Francis Trollope from England came over to marvel at and be disgusted by what they took to be American manners, all in Cincinnati. Tough guy's town. Good place to produce Pete Rose. Pete Rose was born on April 14, 1941, in Anderson Ferry on the banks of the Ohio River, five miles downstream from the city. There's a west side and an east side, and on the east side you have quiche and white wine and croquet. And on the west side you have beer and uh, barbecue and bowling. Where Pete Rose grew up on the west side of Cincinnati was right across the river from Kentucky, and really in feel and texture, it was more related to Appalachia than it was to city life. What we used to do was hunt rats, especially when the river would come up every year. We had rafts, 
and we had three or four creeks that went into the river. We had swimming holes in with the ropes tied on the trees to swing across and stuff like that, you know. So it was kind of like primitive. I was very fortunate, though, because when I was growing up, it was the late 40s and 50s, and there wasn't much more for us kids to do except play baseball in the summertime and football when it was football season and basketball when it was basketball season. It was uh, families, working class people. Everybody knew each other. This guy lived there. He passed away, his kids lived there. He passed away, his kids lived there. Generations and generations lived in the same houses forever. Part of the Pete Rose story was the Harry Rose story. The game passed down to the son, the son paying homage back to the father. Harry Rose was a great semi-pro football player until he was nearly 50. And Pete got this incredible physicality from his father. Cincinnati did not have a professional football team at that time, and uh, it was a big deal to be uh, a semi-pro football player in those days, and my dad was uh, the best in town. He was always one of those, you know, if a guy's got a different color jersey on and the whistle ain't blown, knock him on his can. And if you tackle him low, he'd kick you in the face. If you tackle him high, he'd stiff arm you in the face. Pete was the water boy for the football team. He was the bat boys for the baseball team. They were buddies. They were inseparable. From the time Pete was a year old, he was out in the backyard playing ball. When they'd come home and we'd be at the dinner table, we all had dinner together, and he could have hit three grand slam home runs, but they had dwelled on what he didn't do right, and it was always keep hustling. He taught me how to be dedicated. He taught me the importance of winning, but he did it in the right way. He never criticized me in front of people, never yelled at me. He would correct me in his own little demeanor. He didn't believe in mental mistakes. While it was his father who forged Pete, his entry into organized baseball in 1960 was made possible by his uncle Buddy, a scout for the Reds. Pete was drafted out of high school mostly as a favor to an uncle of his. He was a non-prospect in the eyes of baseball. He reported to his rookie league team in Geneva, New York, and he was this crew-cut headed kid, had a beat-up old suitcase, and he had a bat strapped to the suitcase. And he comes upon Asa Brooks, the general manager of the team, and Asa Brooks says to him, who the hell are you? Pete says, I'm your new second baseman, mister. He has no idea who the second baseman of that team is. All he knows is he's better than the guy, whoever he is. In 1963, after hitting 317 in three minor league seasons, the switch hitting Rose was invited to spring training with the Reds. Pete was a cocky little guy, wasn't that big. And I said, well, this kid's never going to make it. You know, he's a skinny little runt, but uh, he's got a lot of... Uh, Vim and vigor. Don Blazing game was our second baseman, coming off an outstanding year the year before. Really well liked by his teammates. And Pete came in the spring train and just, what I call, really literally ran Don Blazing game off the team with his hustle. Rookies were supposed to be seen and not heard and wait their turn, and Pete wasn't cut out that way. Pete wanted to be the star right away. He alienated just about everybody. In those days, the Reds were a real clickish type team. They didn't know how to accept me because I was cocky. I had to be. I had to, I had to be that way to believe in myself. Pete had a different uh, side of him that nobody could figure out. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. And for whatever reason, uh, he took up with Tommy Harper and Frank Robinson, and he went his own way with them. Those guys treated me like one of the gang. I don't know if because they felt sorry for me or if, if they just thought I was going to be a good baseball player. And uh, they knew I wanted to win. We kind of just accepted him as one of us because we know what he was going through. We had kind of been through that kind of stuff ourselves. They called him a hot dog, even his own teammates. They were standoffish toward him. I actually got called in the Cincinnati Reds front office and I was told I was hanging with the black players too much. And I told him, I said, hey, I don't care what color their skin is, they're treating me like a human being. A nickname was tied to Rose that would follow him like the tail on a kite. Charlie Hustle is everything that's Pete. The nickname 
came to him from Whitey Ford and Mickey Mantle that first spring training with the Reds. They called him Charlie Hustle, and it was not a positive nickname. No one had ever seen somebody, when they got walked, run down the first like nobody's business, you know what I mean? They said, this guy is really off his rocker. Pete being Pete said, Charlie Hustle, that's me. He just refused to accept it as a, as a derisive nickname. On the field, he was chesty and full of himself. Off the field, he was chesty and full of himself. After the game, Pete would have three young ladies. You could tell who they were, you know. They were the main headliners at some uh, go-go joint or whatever, and Pete was to walk right by the bus with a girl on each arm, and guys just said, Where, where's this guy coming from? Where do you learn all this stuff being a rookie, you know? There was the radio star of the game show, and you got 50 bucks for being the star of the game. And the tradition on the Reds was to pool that money. Pete said, no, I'm the star of the game more than anybody else. I'm going to keep all the money. Over time, it became perfectly clear to Pete's teammates that Pete was about money, and Pete was about Pete. I can remember he went on the road, he went to L.A., and I hadn't heard from him, and I was just dating him. I thought, well, let me give him a call out in California. He was rooming with Jim Coates at that time. And I said, is uh, Pete there? He said, oh, wait a minute, let me check. No, wait a minute. I'm not that dumb. There's only one room, two beds, and a bathroom. Now, where's he going to look? Is he under the bed? No. So anyway, he said, he's not here. Well, within 15, 20 minutes, he calls. He said, well, you sure did mess it for me. He said, there was a girl I was talking to out in the, the hallway. So, I mean, I should have known. When they got married right after Pete's rookie year, I'm saying to myself, how could he marry this girl in reality? Because, I mean, he's not ready to settle down. I mean, this guy has just started. When I went to Pete's wedding, there was a banquet downtown for baseball, and Pete was going to be honored that night. So Pete left the reception. So I saw Pete for a minute at the wedding, and then he took off. I said, how could he have a reception and not be there? <laughs> That's Pete. By the end of the 60s, Rose's credentials were piled high enough to impress even him. Rookie of the year, two batting titles, four seasons with 200 hits. He was proving to be as good as he told everyone he was. One day, I remember we lost the game, and I was 0 for 4 that night. And this particular game, my dad was outside by my car, which was unusual. And I come out, and he said, let me ask you something. Second time up tonight, when you hit that ball to second base, did you run hard to first? That's a direct reflection on me when you don't hustle on the baseball diamond. And I just wanted to bring that to your attention to let you know that someone's watching you every night when you play the game. And the someone is me. Despite all of Rose's fire and fury, the Reds could not break through in the postseason in the early 70s, losing three times. And then, in the 1975 World Series, the Big Red Machine found itself locked in an epic struggle with the Red Sox in Game 6. Pete comes up. He's not tired. He's jabbering about, man, this is the greatest game I've ever played in. Don't you think? Hey, Fisky, what do you think? This is the greatest game. This is what baseball is all about. He says, Skip, was that the greatest game? you have ever played. And I said, Peter, I've always known you're crazy. Now I know you're crazy. I'm not going to sleep tonight. And you think this is the greatest game we've ever played. He said, oh, don't worry about it. We're going to win tomorrow. Cincinnati has won the world championship, beating the Boston Red Sox 4-3. to three. I couldn't be happier if I had all the money in the world and everything. I, this is the happiest moment of my life. I'm scared I'm going to have a coronary. I really... Pete, congratulations. That's still the greatest World Series I've ever broadcast. And I'm down on the field, and Johnny Bench comes over to me. He says, you know, you ought to talk to, to Pete Rose. He, he likes you. I don't know him that well. Talk to him about what? He says, the company he's keeping. I says, what do you mean? Well, he's got some bad guys he runs around with, and he's going to run into trouble. He's going to be coarse something straight out of the gutter and you're gonna find it charming and you're gonna laugh with him he's gonna make you laugh and you're gonna believe everything he says you know i've never been one that was short on confidence i think if we played him 10 games we beat him eight the way they played 
Have you set some sort of a goal for yourself as to a member of history? Yeah, yeah, to be, what are you, 41? 41. 41? No, not at all. Are you kidding? When you walked in, I said, that's a young guy. What do you wear on your uniforms? <laughs> Wear long johns, otherwise they're cut no off. So we need panel for when you go. <laughs> Dealing with the press was the best thing that could happen to all of us, and Pete was Pete dealt with the press, and because they loved him. One of the joys of my career in baseball journalism were those days spent with Pete Rose talking about hitting, looking at his bat so where he'd oil the bats down every day so that he'd get fresh marks on his bat so that he knew exactly where the ball was on his bat when he'd foul them off. Pete started out as a ball player in a print era when the newspaper guys counted. To the very end, Pete knew everybody's name, every beat reporter's name. You could be writing for the podunk suburban uh, daily, and Pete looked at you and said, hey, Joe, great story yesterday. And, you know, that, what does the press want? They want to be recognized. And that won him a lot of leeway down near the end when he needed it. It's not like I'm going to get my 3,000 in and retire because I still have hopes and ambitions of being number one in the National League. Uh, that's 36-31. Pete really knows his, his numbers. And when my son Jeremy was eight years old, I had him interview Pete Rose during spring training. How many more years do you think you're going to be in baseball? Uh, I hope Maybe uh, 700 more hits. I don't look at it as years. I, I play every year for hits. Jeremy asked him uh, whether he was going to pass Cap Anson and Napoleon Lajue that season. You need 35 more hits to have 34. 34? 34. Oh. And you're, you're going to pass Roberto Clemente for sure. Yeah, he got 3,000 exactly. For the 1 0 pick, swung on. <laughs> Rose never seemed to run out of numbers to stalk. In the summer of 78, with the cherished 3,000 hit in his possession, he launched yet another pursuit, Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak. His 44-game hitting streak was the damnedest thing I've ever seen. I never felt it was a me, me, me deal. People would say to me, you know, all he cares about is hitting 300 and getting 200 hits and scoring 100 runs. I said, wait a minute. If he does all of that, that's going to enhance his team's chances of winning. Are you getting tired? Tired? Yeah, we're getting tired of talking to you. That's <laughs> When baseball's second longest hitting streak stopped at 44, Rose chose to assess the blame on the Braves' Gene Garber, who refused to serve him enough fastballs. He was really upset when the, when the streak broke in Atlanta, coming through there, and that's the first time Pete was really fuming. <laughs> Off the field, Rose either couldn't accept what his wanton ways were doing to his family, or he didn't care all that much. He never had enough women, and you were constantly coming across women who'd had affairs with him. They all were given the same sort of Pete Rose signature collection of Porsches, presidential Rolexes, and boob jobs. I was guilty of a, of a paternity suit in, the, in Tampa, Florida. Which is a mistake. It's, everybody makes mistakes. Uh, but I lived my obligation for that mistake and uh, paid, uh, paid every day. I came across a woman who had this child who didn't know that Pete was his father. She loved him. She was still in love with him. And the sad part about it is that she was involved with him when she was a high school girl wearing a Catholic school girl's uniform. Pete observed no rules. Women on the road, women at home. You know, that was a ball player's birthright. And his first wife, Carolyn, actually said, Pete, you know, you want to go have a girlfriend? There's nothing I can do about it. Just don't embarrass me in Cincinnati. So what did Pete do? Embarrassed her in Cincinnati. Rose's latest conquest was Carol Rowling, a Philadelphia Eagles cheerleader who had become his wife in 1984. I got her at the Reds ball game. Well, she's standing there, going to get a Coke. She had a 
necklace on that had an on and off switch that had a diamond in there. Come on, that's my daughter's. Are you nuts? Don't be giving some woman a diamond unless you're going to give it to my kids. I just went and I grabbed it off of her. So she hurried up and ran. I'm sure it offended some people, but, you know, I was little and I just want to be around that. I could care less if there was 87,000 women or no women or whatever, as long as I was next to him. He can take everything else away from me. Everything. He can't take my children. He can't take fun. He can't take Pete. These are mine. These are mine. You gave them to me, Pete. And I hope that one day that he can actually say, I did love you, kids. And I didn't know how to say I love you. Baseball is everything. That's what was important. But if you have the choice of being a superstar or being a superstar dad, I'm going to pick being a superstar dad just because of my experiences. I know what it's like to come from a divorced family. It's not important to put the blame on somebody today because it's something that's in the past is over with. Forget about it. You know, they go on with their life. I went on with my life. and Pete's going on with his life. And my little girl's... Uh, the Fawn's going on with her life in Seattle. So, you know, uh, everybody seems to be uh, pretty happy right now. And that's the important thing. Not the fact that, you, were you happy in 1979? Who cares? He was the only big guy of the four guys that they talked about on the Cincinnati Red to talk to the young kids. He invited us over for dinner during the time we were on road trips. He got me a sport coat that I couldn't afford. That was Pete Rose. Ever eager for new conquests, Rose left the Reds after 16 seasons and rented himself out as a free agent hired gun to Philadelphia. At $800,000 a year, he was baseball's highest paid player. For the forlorn Phillies who had never won a World Series, he was a steal. Here it is 79, and I think I got a group of guys that have been knocking on the door can get to the World Series, and that's why I went there. All they needed was a leader. They saw me approach the game the way I did for 162 games in 1979. And it kind of brought us together in 1980, and that's when we won it. By the spring of 1981, Rose had three World Series championships, and he was the only player to start the All-Star game at five positions. With 3,557 hits, he was also closing in fast on Stan Musial's record. He would write 3631 on his trademark on his bats and that was the National League hitting record. And once he got that, then he put 4,000 on there. Once he got the 4,000, he put 4,191. He could see Ty Cobb's record whenever he picked up his bat. Hello. Hello. Pete Rose. Yes, sir. Listen, this is Ronald Reagan. How you doing? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I'll tell you. I've had as much trouble getting this line, or a lot. I think I had to wait longer than you did to <laughs> to break the record. Well, we were going to give you five more minutes, and that was it. <laughs> Age began to thicken Rose and slow his bat speed, but there was still a market for a player chasing a record. So Montreal took him in 1984, and then he ended up full circle back in Cincinnati later that year as player manager. On September 11th, 1985. Rose, at 44, finally was able to hug the record that was his grand obsession. If you have a lump in your throat, you're only human. Everybody on their feet here at Riverfront Stadium. 2-1 pitch from Shaw. All my emotions always stayed inside of me. You know, you play a certain way for a certain amount of time. People didn't think that I had feelings. For Pete Rose, this certainly is crowning achievement. Now all of a sudden it's seven minutes. Now all of a sudden it's eight minutes. And I'm the only one on the field. That's the only time in my life I was ever on a baseball diamond that felt uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do. You start thinking about people responsible for you being there. And in my case, my father, my biggest idol I ever had, who had passed away in 1970. 
And that's what brings the tears to your eyes. It's the first time I've seen you cry. That was basically the first time he really grabbed me and hugged me. He just said, I've seen your grandfather in the sky. And he just turned and he told me he loved me. What happened to me at first base that night and what happened to the fans, they didn't realize that they were actually seeing three generations of Pete Rose flash in front of their eyes in nine minutes. You know, I think ever since then, everything has just been a plus. He grabbed me like I've never been grabbed before, and since then, every time I see him, that's the same kind of hug I get. He's got a point because he's got to make the call right now. Oh, boy. Oh, uh oh, uh oh, oh, boy. They better grab Pete. I see guys push umpires every day and get two or three days. I got 30 days. Suspended for the 1988 shoving incident with umpire Dave Pallone, Rose's troubles were only just beginning. It all grew out of Gold's Gym, which at one point was called Pete Rose's Gold Gym, where there was steroid trafficking, there was some cocaine trafficking going on. That's where a lot of the baseball bets were placed. I kind of backed off and said, whoa, this is beyond a sports story here. But when I went to the investigative editor at Sports Illustrated, he was all for it. Because I said, look, I've got information that Pete Rose bet on baseball. Pete came to baseball a gambler, uh, a horse gambler, very early on a sports gambler. And his teammates knew that. And Pete wasn't the only gambler. But what was different about Pete is that Pete's gambling habit grew and grew and grew and it became his passion other than baseball. I remember once I went to his house and he has this Philadelphia Eagle cheerleader who became his wife. And she's in these tall pumps and hot pants just trying to get a little attention from Pete. But Pete's not giving any attention because he goes right to the satellite dish. And he's keeping the satellite dish. I mean, it's hotter than a walk, you know? And he's got all oh, the freaking Canucks, you know? And what's wrong with the Blue Jays? And, you know. He's like taking every score we see on the satellite dish to heart. Even when he was managing, playing, he still had to be betting. You know, there just wasn't enough action. One of the reasons he bet on baseball is because he was so good at it. He lost so much on the other sports. He was uncanny when it came to baseball. I was down in the Reds Dream Week, and he had just bought this big home in Plant City. He invited us back for a drink. So we get back there, and for about an hour, he's showing us every room. I said, hey, Pete, I, I'm sick of looking at all these beautiful rooms. How about a cold beer? So he took us up in his room and he opened up this refrigerator. He said, how about some cold cash? And he threw each one of us a big bundle. We we're all like $100 bills, you know? It was like about maybe two, three $300,000 worth of cold cash. <laughs> well, if you're a gambler and you don't want to be discovered as a gambler, then you pay your debts, you pay off your bookies. Pete didn't pay off his bookies. For a long time, he was dealing with pretty small-time bookies in Cincinnati. He said, oh, well, that's Pete. And I think it was like a loss leader for them or a write-off. But at the very end, he was dealing with mob-connected bookmakers. When he didn't pay off them, you know, that was a different story. And I think that's also something that drew baseball's attention. A baseball bombshell. Inside and outside a courtroom today, reports of the strongest evidence yet linking Cincinnati Reds manager Pete Rose to charges of betting on baseball and betting on his team. Nine witnesses, in one way or another, give information about... Pete Rose betting on baseball or the Reds. We had his hotel records, we had the cell phone records, we had the middleman records, and we just lined them up. And you can just see it's absolutely overwhelming what he was doing every single night. There are a number of people who were close to Pete who say, yes, he bet on baseball. And a lot of these people, Paul Jansen, Tommy Giosa, uh, Ron Peters, are not are not friendly with each other some of them put each other in jail they have no reason to get together and and make up stories about pete rose we would sit in the clubhouse just like you and i are sitting here and and he'd be you know putting on his uniform or whatever and and looking over the sheet and just just picking up the line get an outside line and bet the game or have me bet it and we didn't think it was 